Thank you, Danae. Thanks for the invite. Thanks, yeah. Danae. I mean, you know, the conversations that have been going on in, in, this, in Toronto, especially, um, and we're in an interesting time. And so, as you can see, I've titled this series Racism in Canada because I feel like there will be other discussions. Tonight's focus will be on education. And it was prompted from the announcement by the Ontario government that they're going to stop the grade nine streaming. And I was, you know, reaching out to Lisa for something else. And then Lisa said, let me loop in Karen. And then the rest is what we have tonight. So before we get into anything, I want to do some brief in introductions. So at the top of the screen for everyone who's joining us um, is Lisa Tomlinson, Dr. Lisa Tomlinson. <laughs> um, so Lisa is currently a professor with University of the West Indies in Jamaica. Um, you are professor, teacher, author, cultural critic, and you are in humanities and community research, if I'm not mistaken. Um, cultural studies and literary studies, yeah. Cultural, cultural studies. studies, yeah, African diaspora. Okay. So, so just say hi to the folks so everybody knows who's speaking at each time and clarify the, the, the faculty you're in so they can track it down. Yeah, and just a, a quick cor um, correction. You know, in the uh, in the Caribbean, the designations of lecturers, professor, senior lecturer are different. So I'm a lecturer, not professor. Okay. <laughs> so, yes. yeah, so I need to correct that. And um, yeah, I'm in the... Institute of Caribbean Studies, which is in the Faculty of Humanities and Education. Mm -hmm. Okay. And we have Karen Tomlinson. There is a relation, yes, folks. <laughs> they are sisters. And Karen is a healthcare professional. Um, she's done health promotion. And um, more recently, she's been um, in the last couple of years, really, um, project management um, as it relates to healthcare and our communities. So say hi to the folks, Karen. Hello, I'm so pleased to be here with you, Danae, and with um, my sister, Lisa, all the way in Jamaica, um, quite far from us, but um, in our hearts, of course. So I'm looking a, a little bit aside just to make sure that people are tuned in. So I'm just checking on my device and I'm seeing that we have six viewers so far. So some people, Danae, asking me how they could join in. And yes. um, so I'm just wondering how I could send them a link or perhaps send them your page. Yeah, so you can send them my page. But what I'm going to do right now, I'm going to share it as a post on my page and you can share that. Okay, that's great. And um, folks, if you, you know, don't necessarily like the layout or whatever view you're getting or sound you're getting on Facebook, I've also sent it over to my YouTube channel, which is Divet2, D-I-V-E-T-T-E-2. -T -T -E um, so we'll see, you can see it there as well. I'm getting feedback, so I'm assuming it's from my device trying to log in. <laughs> um, so yeah, so we're gonna get going. Um, for those who missed this, we'll rebroadcast it. Um, but we want to get into the conversation because you know Facebook has time limits, and we're trying not to go over, but we may. <laughs> so Danae, well, sorry, one more thing. On mm -hmm. your page, it's uh, you have it as private. So if you could make it public and we could share it out, that would be oh, great. The, the, oh, the link I shared is shared as private? Yeah. Okay, let's do that. Uh, da, 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 da. Let's see all these little things to do. Um, so yeah. So let me just make this post not private. Uh, Okay, done. Okay, so here we go. We're running. <laughs> we are running. We're rolling. 
Um, so ladies, I wanted to really center the conversation on, um, as we're calling it, racism in Canada series, first topic, education. So I wanted us to start out by talking about the racism in Canada, right? Because what I've been noticing, especially since the George Floyd issue and the, the, the resurgence of Black Lives Matter as, you know, as a moniker, as a hashtag, and all the other attending conversations, I've noticed that the Canadians have been trying to tell themselves that there is no racism in Canada. And that has perturbed me. So that is really why I'm centering the conversation and establishing for them, why would I have a conversation about education with the lens, the lens on an opening up and deconstructing racism? And that's because in Canada itself, there has been racism and continues to be racism in education, the topic that we're dealing with tonight. And for me, it showed up in, um, in doing the research for it, it showed up in, in the following ways, right? Um, there was segregation of schools um, in this year, Canada. So everybody might know about indigenous children and how they have been treated. Um, but black children, they had Negro schools. Mm -hmm. um, and so the last, the last segregated school closed in 1983. Could you imagine? Nova Scotia. Like, yeah. It's not like it's not like many many moons are going on. Like I was a kid, I was a kid when that happened. Yeah. I mean, I was we were in school here in Canada. We were going to school. We were learning about uh, the civil rights movement, but we were never told that. Well, you know, there's a segregated school in Nova Scotia, right? Yeah, and also too, um, Denny. I like the way you started that out. That is actually that what I was going to when when I saw that you were going to look at the historical framework of. Yeah racism in the education system. Oftentimes yeah. we think about racism, we think about residential schools, by all, rightfully so, but because of the way the narratives around segregation that happens in America, and that segregation, what was so um, disturbing, it was legalized. So the provincial Ontario, the courts legalized the segregation in, in Nova Scotia and in um, Ontario, particularly in the Southwestern Right, southern western um, Ontario, where that would have been the concentration of the um, black people who were coming over from the underground railway. And also was what was disturbing is the way in which these segregated schools were formed. Um, they were formed by trustees, all white trustees. So when they were creating this idea of public school system, within their the back of that um, structure was, hey, public school system, we would think that would have been open to the broader or wider public, but within that context was, we're gonna also have, as you mentioned, Negro schools. So we're gonna have segregated school to the point where um, trustee, they would tamper with the boundaries where black people live, just so they could ensure that they were being um, segregated school. And parents would also complain to the point where they would force black parents to keep their children home. So that is even a part of the segregation. Yeah. And and so, and a fallout from that means, of course, access, right? Mm -hmm. And lack thereof. And so one of the other ways that racism shows up is um, acceptance to schools, right? So, um, you know, people who wanted to study medicine can't get into the top med schools, can't get into any med, med program in Canada. Um, people who want to do nursing. Imagine we've, we've had so much studies done on immigrant nurses and only to find out that if they wanted to go to nursing school in the, you know, up to the, I think it was the sixties, there was still yeah. challenge, right? Like 1940s. Yeah. They were not allowed yeah. black nurses, black nurses. Black women. Yeah, it was a black woman, but black women weren't allowed to attend nursing school. And yeah. this was a, um, and I'm glad you brought that up as, as well, because it wasn't only at this, the public school level, it was also at the um, post-secondary level where we also saw that institutionalized, legalized um, segregation and yeah. racism in um, Canadian schools. Yeah, and, and we found that 
um, for me in the research, what is interesting, um, schools like McGill University, named for a slave owner and formed by a slave owner, it is not surprising to me that in the early 1900s, this school would not accept blacks, right? So there's, there's that other little element um, of the slavery that happened in Canada that we don't like to talk about mm -hmm. and, and how that impacts impressions of people and letting them into the system, right? So if you are deemed less than, obviously we don't want you in our school, right? <laughs> you know what I mean? So that, that is one of the ways historically that racism has shown up is in acceptance and access um, in what we, we um, know as segregated schools. And then now we get down to the, the, the level that we're at today where we're talking about streaming. Um, so they indicated that they're cutting out the grade nine streaming. But from conversations that I've had with educators in the system, streaming has always happened like it doesn't necessarily get isolated to the grade nine experience is that is that what you found as well mm -hmm. so, um streaming uh when we were going to school you know they had basic which was the lowest level if you went into basic this this meant that um you would go into the trade um college and university was closed off to you then they had um general which was a stream that streamed you into um uh, college and then they had the advanced where you would learn everything that you had to learn in order to go to um university and um so they they've changed the names because um i guess they thought that those names were stigmatizing the the basic, the general, the advanced, but specifically the basic. And uh, they brought in uh, Essential. Mm -hmm. And um, Lisa, if you could help me here. Yeah. They brought in Essential, which was basically basic. And then they brought in Applied, which was general. That would, again, as you said, would suggest that you had the opportunity to go to college. And then they had in the academic. Academic, yeah. So, so it's a different name, but the exact same thing, right? And so there was a there was a time, and I I believe it was in the nineties when they had stopped streaming in grade nine, but then they picked up streaming once again, right? And, yeah. and so when when we're told that uh, there's not gonna there's no longer gonna be streaming in grade nine, and I think that they said that this was gonna start in twenty twenty one. 2021 September 2021. Mm -hmm. um, we have to really keep. So our not eyes. even immediately, you know, not even yeah. immediately. Yes. And, and on top of that, it's, it, they're going to start with math, right? Which is which is quite diff. It's it's quite difficult for some people, but they're going to start with mm -hmm. math. They're not starting with English or history or French or any of the uh, geography, any of the other subjects. They're starting with math. They're not starting with science. So um so so there's that, but. I, I, I want to tell you about, um, this is high school. As, you, as we know that in junior school, they don't have streaming, right? In kindergarten, grade eight. But what they do have and what they did have when I was going into school was they had groups. So they had math groups within your class. You had a math group or you had a, a, a French group or a, an English group. And I remember mine, um, the, this teacher I had, she said she didn't want these groups to have any stigma. So she named the group Snap, Crackle, Pop. And um, I can't remember which one was the lowest, but it was either Crackle or Pop, that which was the lowest. But when you start, like, it, once you're in that group, it goes in your, it goes on your report card that, you know, you're in a, you're in a group where you're struggling. Um, never mind that you're doing very well in the group. It's very difficult to, um, to, to get, to move up. get into that group into the higher group. The thing about these groups as well, it's not, um, it's systemic, but it's not written within policies. This is, this is what's going on within the classroom. You know, our parents, parents are not in the classroom and the policymakers are not in the classroom. So this is what's going on in the classroom. So when I hear about the um, doing away with streaming, I am, I'm afraid that somehow, some way, a, st a streamer will still exist in, in other forms as it did in the snap crackle pop. So mm -hmm. it's um, it's important that uh, 
we keep our eyes. So we're, we're told that this is going to happen in 2021, that we don't sleep on it, right? We keep our eyes on it so that there's um, evaluation is, is done to see uh, what what types of changes are actually going on in the, in the school. Uh, something else that came out recently was that um, they were going to start collecting race-based statistics in um, in this in the high schools and in the junior schools and this yeah. was going to start in in 2023 that's been three years <laughs> of course it, and give it, them three years um, to clean up some of the yeah. stuff <laughs> and hide yeah. some of the stuff <laughs> and how do we know that with the, the 2021 how are we going to know that the d stream in the 2021 we can't we don't have enough time to wait two more years to see if, if mm -hmm. that is if that's working. And if, if I could so, add, Karen, so we're uh, very quickly, Dene, if I could just add um, a, a point which um, Karen brought out in terms of the, the streaming that is not so evident. Other types of streaming that they use in junior school, and um, I'm, I'm not sure how they're using this right now. They were using streaming in the form of French immersion. So oftentimes, Black students didn't get the opportunity to be in French immersion. It's just recently in the last maybe 15, 20 years where black students are even, because that was seen as something that was off to black students and also how they stream black students in the, the junior um, level into behavioral, behavioral classes and how they stream them into special education classes. So when they're in special edu education classes in junior school, that will automatically mean that you're going to base it when you get to high school. So those are the type of streaming that were not into policies or legislated, but they were part and parcel of that um, ways in which to disadvantage and, and act, like accessibility in terms of education to black students. And, and Lisa, I must say that, you know, in reading the different reports and in reading the, the new policies that are coming down the pipeline, is that there's no mention of those types of, of the behavioral programs. I mean, there is mention of um, suspension um, I can't remember what type of suspension they, they call it, but um, they, you know, they're, they're cutting back on suspension. They categorize the behavior yeah. as we've heard. It. But, I, look, but, but from someone who I have actually worked in a suspended um, program, I worked in a suspended program for three years, and some of the suspended programs are actually within the school system, right? And, and it's just a, a separate class and Sometimes it's in a separate part of the school where there aren't very many other students. And mm -hmm. so we have to make sure that when they say that they're not suspended, we're not just talking about putting our kids outside of the school. We're talking about taking our kids outside of their classrooms and segregating them into mm -hmm. suspended classrooms, yes, right? Yes. Or language development, or language de development classroom, because that those were also streaming. So you have an accent, you don't say doll, you say dolly. So you're just coming from, because as, I, as I, I worked, I, I spoke with you about this today, um, working in the school board as a um, translation assessment officer or um, translator, and it was geared towards Caribbean students. And that just recently came out and it was a part of it, it was as advocacy. But prior to that, you had an accent and you ended up in this class. And this class would take you away from your regular sessions. And usually the sessions would be in math, science, the important um, classes. So again, those are the type of under the carpet streaming that we have to be careful when someone sends a letter home to a parent and say, your child needs communication because they're not pronouncing the word in this particular way, or your child has behavioral problem. Oftentimes I remember distinctly the behavioral class was pop up a black voice because they were the ones with the behavioral problem. Because we know that one thing that um, Canadian schools, um, education system do, they adultify, they, the adultification, like, so children are not treated as children. So this is where the, you know, that criminalization of black bodies begin within these behavioral classes. And they're like five-year-olds, 10-year-olds in these behavioral yeah. classes. Yeah, over yeah. But but it has it has an historical foundation, right? So, mm -hmm. um, and you're you're on the next item really, which is the behavioral conversation and the school safety officers conversation, because I see that as racism in the system. Um, and just just to to further make that point, the towards race equity in education, the schooling of black students in the Greater Toronto Area report by James Ann Turner said 42% of black students have been suspended at least once 
compared mm -hmm. to only 18% of white students by the time students graduated from high school in the Toronto District School Board. The idea of, um, you know, as, as you say, wait, wait, what's the word? Adultification. <laughs> yes, adultification. It's a word taken from, not Bell Hooks. I, I, I'm forgetting the writer here. But yes. When I get the name out, yes. but it's a, it's, a, it's a way in which um, black children are adults, are, are made into adults, and, yes. and it's through the form of criminalization. So, for example, I remember in the article they speak about white children not returning their books, and they're just oh, children who forget it. You know, they forget, yeah, it's just just kids. But when black kids did not return their books to the library, they were trying to steal it, yes. and there's there that that way in which we adultify or adultify um, um, young ch um, black children, especially black boys, because again we see even in terms of how um, you just mentioned, um, we've, there's been cases, even in Canada, people are not aware of where a police is called in. I remember distinctly, um, Karen, you would remember the case, my cousin was 11 and she and her uh, 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 a, a, a white girl got into a tr uh, foolishness, 11 year old foolishness. The, while the, white, the police went to the white girl's home and spoke to the parent, they had demanded, demanded that my, my cousin bringing her daughter to the police station. Then this was, um, I remember distinctly which division it is. And I made it clear to them that we're not gonna sit here and be interrogated for 11 year old squabble. Where's a white child and her family? So there, that is an adultification where already this 11 year old girl was being treated like a big woman <laughs> where she had to be brought into a police station for a, a squabble. Yeah, so and, and, yeah. and then and then we see a six-year-old being taken out in handcuffs, right? So <laughs> and, and, and they said she had behavioral issues, right? So you you can't manage a six-year-old in a classroom. You no, you you never got that in teaching practice. Come so on. Denise, I will, I will tell you that 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 six that was not the first nor the last time that has that has happened. I've personally been involved with a, a family where their eight-year-old was taken out of the classroom in handcuffs and brought to the hospital and the mother the, the mother lived away from the school in the hospital it took about 45 minutes for the mother to get to the hospital and when the mother got to the hospital the child was on the hospital bed still in handcuffs this was a eight-year-old child who more who looks like he's five years old when i asked him how he felt he said the police treated me like a robber. This is how. This is what he said. And it, that that family, they don't feel comfortable coming out and speaking yeah. about the situation because there's a Which lot of school board. Which school board? Well, this this is in um, Orangeville, so okay. I'm not quite sure what school board is in Orangeville. Um, that mm -hmm. might that might be Dufferin. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's a Dufferin. That's Peel. Peel Dufferin. Dufferin. Well. Mm -hmm. The different school board, board. it's called different because it wasn't Catholic. You know, it's a Catholic one that's different Peel. Yeah. But um, yes, it was it was that school board, but that wasn't and and I, I have um I have other instances where I could tell you that the yeah. police comes and put handcuffs on. Again, when I worked at the school for suspended youth, when the youth got together, there were different youth that were in the class. Of course, they were mostly black youth, but when they spoke about what they did, you know, some of them did graffiti, other ones got into fights. Uh, some of them were at, got into the same fight, but they were on the same side of the fight. But one got taken away. Once parents got called, and one had to be taken to the uh, station later on, and the other one got brought out of the school in handcuffs. And we know who got brought out of the school in the handcuffs, yes. right? And the black so, kid. The black school. And so, as we're talking about, um, um, in when you know Doug Ford and uh, Stephen Lisi were talking about um, the changes that's going to be made within the system, I don't believe I heard anything about changes to the the, the resource it's officers. Safety resource officers. Yes, that, and those resource officers, sorry, Karen, um, those resource officers are placed strategically in what, because again, um, we're, we're delusional in, in Canada where we don't think that we live in black communities, but you're not gonna find, you're not gonna find a resource officer in Richview because we know demographically where Richview is located. It's in Etobicoke, but just go, um, 20 minutes or is it a half an hour up the street where you'll see schools in North Etobicoke, they're going to have resource officers. So while they're within the same demographic Etobicoke, or, um, right, because the schools are 
situated or located within a, a, a black community. So, so, so and, and economic. Socioeconomic, exactly. So therefore, there's, there, that is where you're going to find um, the resource officers. Just like how I remember, um, it was hilarious. Um, uh, one, uh, one time, uh, a relative again was re registering to a school, and one of the schools was in Jane and Finch, the other school was in Jane and Shepherd. All right, it was the most bizarre thing. But the school in Jane and Finch was in Driftwood area. And the one that was in Jane and Shepherd was in the residential hidden area of Jane and Finch. And I remember them distinctly trying to convince us that she has to go to the school in the Jane and Finch area because that is where she lived. And that is where, and then even the way when you went on the school board, the Toronto District School Board, the word that they used to describe the school in the Jane and Finch area versus the school in Jane and Shepherd were totally different. First of all, they used residential. To describe that school in Jane and Shepherd versus the school area Shepherd. are residential. Yeah, and, and where in, and, and Driftwood is residential, but yet they were using inner city to describe it. This was on the Toronto District School Board. And my, my my point is that when you leave those two, and again it's just up the street from each other, you're not gonna find resource officers, right? Or or those types of um, surveillance in these different types of school. It was just, I couldn't believe it. And even in terms of the subject that they were offering, right? Um, they were offering um, uh, Spanish, um, French, because generally they just offer French. If you get into the more Forest Hills High School, they have German, right? And even the, the, the terms of um, the, the, the music facility that they have, it's, uh, that's something that needs to also be looked at in terms of the disparity that's that is being offered on the under resourcing yes. of certain schools in certain areas mm -hmm. which are likely going to be serving communities of color you can see mm -hmm. a difference in mm -hmm. even the resources that are um, available mm -hmm. so we we've kind of come into the lived experience um mm -hmm. bit because you've you've shared some stories of persons you've had to help or advocate for but you have gone through the system mm -hmm. So tell, tell me from your perspective um, how racism in the education system in Canada showed up for you and even your experience with streaming. It was, it was horrible. It was terrible. It was horrible. I have no, I'm, like I'm not mincing no words here. Um, the education system was, uh, in terms of streaming, it, it had to do with your self-esteem. Um, because again, people don't understand that streaming, more or less, it sets your life opportunities. So if you're going to go into a school that tells you that you're not bright enough, because that happened to myself and my siblings, all of us. Um, if we, one of us went to communication classes to correct our speech, another one went to um, a special education classes. That, that's, that's you, Karen. Yeah, yeah my two younger, I went to correct my speech. I couldn't um, pronounce R, they said. And I was, with, I was there with another boy, he was a, a white child, and he had a lisp. At the end, he still had a lisp, and I was you speaking. Fix you, know? you fix your R. You fix your R. I fixed my R, and yeah. he, got, he got an award, and I didn't. <laughs> okay, yeah, and these were the kind of daunting experiences, and I remember yeah. their stories, like my siblings, my older siblings, I always say I would love to not just write about them, but even in terms of the entire experience we're talking about, my older siblings who both are now um, university graduates, they were put in special education classes and not special education classes that was supposed to help you in terms of your spelling or you know, in terms of cognitive learning. These were special mental classes. Mentally um, challenged and physically challenged students. These were students who were in wheelchair and they had severe um, mentally challenged, well, muscular <laughs> dystrophy, and, muscular those kind dystrophy. Of things. and so could you imagine the self-esteem that black and, and mark mark you the black children who were in that, those classes they never had those um those they challenges. didn't have developmental challenges have developmental challenges but yet they were in, they were put in there because of again an accent and i know um i always say it is you ask for a personal narrative i usually don't bring out this into um you know, but I think it was at the support of our family where we were able to really just say, you know what, enough is enough. Because I remember when I was going into grade nine and uh, I was told that I can't 
because you're always told that you cannot do this. I can't take science because I'm not good at math. It wasn't until I got older I realized, wait a minute, what, the, what does chemistry, you don't need no breed of math to do chemistry. That is physics. So these were the, or biology, excuse me. And these were the ways in which they would bluntly, and sometimes it wasn't even an undertone, they would bluntly tell you that you cannot do this because you're not smart enough. These were the type of, right? These were the types of messages that uh, were given to us. So I know probably I'm rambling, but <laughs> it's, it's that the experience so, was terrible. So, so what do you do here? Karen. So what they do here uh, in grade eight, when you're how old, 13 years old, this is when you choose what stream that you're going to uh, go into. This is when you basically choose your life, whether you're going to university, college, or you're going to be, a, you're going to go into trade. And so um, I recall when I was in grade eight, the, um, the, the person, the, the guidance counselor came in to the, to the class, the grade eight class, and he said, let's face it. Now, this was in Rexdale. He said, let's face it. Most of you are not going to be going to university. The university courses are hard and there's no need to, to take advance and waste your time and energy because you know you're not going to university anyhow. Mm-hmm. So um, here are the, I think they had like booklets. Here are the booklets for the general courses choose these, choose the courses from here. Mm-hmm. And um, it was supposed to be a fun, it was supposed to be a fun experience to, to, you know, you're going away. It's almost like a rite of passage. You're going to grade nine and now it's time for you to, ch- to choose your, um, to choose your courses. So this is how we got, um, uh, this is how they introduced us to streaming. This is how I was introduced to streaming um, because I had older siblings and um my Lisa's not there now. She had um, disappeared somehow. But yeah. what happened was that um, I I knew what they had been through, and um, some of my siblings they had they had changed schools. So a lot of uh, black students. I don't know how um, pervasive this is right now, but we would go to three different high schools. Where mm-hmm. um, you know you go to one high school, you don't feel welcome. You might go to um, you know second mm-hmm. high school and uh, the the teachers there are trying to get you to go into the general uh, stream, so you leave that high school to go to another high school. I knew all of that, so um, I went out on my own and chose mm-hmm. a school outside of the district, so that mm-hmm. my um, my school would have nothing, so that my grade eight school would have nothing to do with the school that I attended and the um, and the courses that I chose. So this is, this is a thing happened to you to your brain just because I had the understanding of streaming just not to be streamed. And it really isn't fair for, for young people to be making that decision and to be fighting so hard against racism, fighting their, their um, uh, guidance counselors and their math and science teachers. So this is what, this is what continues to happen. Yeah, so for me... Um, I, I was raised in Jamaica and we had streaming in Jamaica. You, you, you knew, and you know, it is no doubt we would have streaming in Jamaica cause we're a colonized people. So the British people like to stream them. So <laughs> we had streaming. So when I came to Canada to university, I thought that no way Canada would have this behavior. No way Canada would be doing these things. This is this. We're no longer in that kind of land, and you know this, these people are progressive people. I was wrong. How how I found out the first interaction I had was when I was running the radio station. We would do co-ops. We'd have co-op students from high school, and we'd have um, internships or co-ops from college. The high school students. Um, came to me from when it was different schools, you would know, right? So if it was from the Catholic school board, um, from the IBA program, you would know they had a different air about them. They had a different confidence and they spoke of going to university and college. While the other students, when they would come, their, their vision of themselves kind of cut off. 
it, it was very interesting to observe. So there's a thing I used to do with the students, especially the high school students. I would take them on a tour of the campus. I would just take one of my lunchtime and just grab them and say, let's go walk around the York University campus. Let's see what York has to offer. I was doing it as a really benign activity. I just wanted them to, you know, feel comfortably in the space and see the campus because it's just one of the, I think, third or fourth largest campus on, on, in the country. Mm -hmm. And one day I'm walking with, with these young ladies and I said, over there is Osgood Hall Law School. Um, you know, when you guys are interested in becoming lawyers, this is a, a notable school you could apply to. And one of the young ladies said to me, I can't apply. And I said, excuse me? What do you mean by you can't apply? You're not interested in law or, you know? And she said, no, I would love to be a lawyer. I have, I have dreams of being a lawyer. I said, so then you apply. <laughs> like, I, it, I never knew that she was being streamed, right? So she said to me, no, I was told by my guidance counselor that I'm not going to university. I said, excuse me, miss, pardon? Mm -hmm. I said to her, okay, that was a lot for me to swallow, but here's what I'll say to you. I don't know how far down the stream you are, but I'll tell you this much. When you are 21, you can apply to this same university that they've told you you can mm -hmm. come to as a mature student. Mm -hmm. I said, so that is, a, that is a hope. I said, in the interim, we have to find out how are you able to unstream yourself because mm -hmm. the system is, is against you. And she said that, you know, even her family was thinking of taking her out of that school and so on. So th that's when I got the, the rude awakening you know, almost a, almost a decade ago. You were kind of right in terms of that streaming doesn't happen in Canada because the truth is it only happens in Ontario. Because we went through the system and it just seems like second nature to us, we can't imagine another system. But in fact, in all the other provinces, they don't have streaming. They only have it in Ontario. Right? It's not lost on, on any of us that Ontario has the most black students and also they have the history of segregated school mm -hmm. as yeah. opposed to the other provinces um ontario and nova scotia and um to add um Dene, um catholic schools because they're not monitored i don't think catholic schools are monitored because we don't really see reports of catholic schools it's mainly toronto district school board and i find that because we went to both school system we went to the toronto district school board and the catholic school the catholic school is worse because when we went to the Catholic school system, more than half, and I'm not exaggerating to add to the story, more than half of the, the, um, the students who were in the Catholic school, at least the Catholic school that we attended, which was um, in the Dana Finch area, were in uh, basic. And there were very few, few um, students who, black students who were, either were in anything else but basic or general. Yeah. Advance was like an opportunity because I was doing a mixture of general advance because I was told that I couldn't do advance this because I don't, I'm weak in math. And also, in addition to that, in the Catholic school, they had something that took streaming to another level. They had something called resource classes. Mm -hmm. So those resource class was not a part of the streaming mm -hmm. where the, 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 the basic, the uh, general and advanced. The resource classes was... Uh, a class that had students who were uh, um, challenged again, special that special needs. It was a special needs class, and that class had black students again who were not special needs, and it was called resource. I don't know if they still have it because again, I find the Catholic school is very until this day they're very and in terms of the anti. I see that peel is getting a heat, mm -hmm. but the Catholic yes. school is still managing to to kind of to avoid it. We've always been very insular of the Catholics, so they're, they're, they're trying to avoid it. And so, I would love some reports coming out of there, there in terms of their graduate, the, um, the number of black graduates. So I, on, I, um, I, I, want to talk a bit, I wanted to talk about, a bit about the Stephen Lewis report. So the Stephen right. Lewis report was done in 1992. I was in high school during that time. And you know, Stephen Lewis did community consultations and focus groups and one-on-one -on -one interviews with community members, children's aid society, and uh, civil servants, and, and students, lots of, you know, college, university, and high school, junior school students. 
And mm -hmm. um, it, it was a pr report that crossed, you know, they talked about policing and the use of tra uh, force and training. They talked about employment and it also talked a lot about education. So um, there were some issues that were highlighted and I have some of the issues and I'm just, I'm going to read out some of the issues and they're, they're going to sound so familiar. This was 1992. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> so um, there was, a, and some of them change, and some of the changes we could talk about. So, for example, there was a lack of representation. So there's not enough black teachers now. Um, the difference between 1992 and now is that you see a lot of um, a, there's a lot more uh, teachers of color, black teachers, right? But it's like, how much power do they have to make a change? Another um, issue highlighted was that there were few role models within the school system. So the school system, besides teachers, there are other um, people who might come into the school and could act as role models. There was uh, no cultural competency for guidance counselors. And so, um, you know, we were all expect to be like uh, Western, uh, Western Europeans or, or what we think, you know, Canadian Anglo-Saxon wasps. Um, there were uh, quite a few racist incidents and it was seen that these racist incidents were tolerated. And myself and Lisa could tell you and tell our audience that they were definitely tolerated where, you know, uh, racist words were said to people yes. and there were no repercussions, right? Yep. Um, there is a, a double standard in discipline, which we have spoken about already. So there's a double standard where, you know, when um, black students will get harsher discipline. Um, and then, of course, streaming, which we're talking about now. So streaming and being discouraged from attending university. Right. Mm -hmm. So today, when we when we look, when we go down the list, a lot of it is still um, even though there's been these were the these were. OK, so these were the highlights mm -hmm. and then the recommendations. I want to tell you a bit about the recommendations, of course. So there was um, but some of the recommendations was uh, to have a. Broad, broaden intake for teacher training. So this is teachers college. So having mm -hmm. more uh, teachers uh, that look and, like the students. <laughs> yeah. Having um, at least 9% of the space within the teachers college to be um, put, put aside for qualified black students. Um, having the board of governors um, at the university, having the, the board more reflective of the population. Mm -hmm. And having anti-racism work and teaching in in school, you know, teaching the the youth and teaching the, the teachers about anti-racism, and implementing multicultural and racist um, anti-racist policies, and and actually uh, evaluating those policies, and um, monitoring their uh, employment equity, and eliminating streaming. This was 1992. There was a recommendation in 1992 to eliminate streaming. And here we are today. And also a review of the admission pro process um, to the faculty and the revision of the curriculum so that it could best um, reflect the student's experience. So here is a, here's a group 1992. of- 1992. 1992. So here's a group of issues that the the, the students and the people that were spoken to highlighted. And here's a list of recommendations um, coming from Stephen Lewis. And we're here today with um, with Stephen Lissy, I believe his name is, Lichy. coming up with Lichy. Yeah. Coming Lichy. out with um, yet a lot of the same, yeah. and same they, recommendations. And, and they will blame the, the, um, the conservative because it was a conservative who struck it down in 1995, I believe, in the early 90s, the streaming. However, we've seen that the liberals have been in power, but they have maintained it. Yes. But, and they've maintained it to the point where they've changed the name. So, so who do you think you're fooling? Yeah. Like, and, and, and it speaks to the systemic nature of the racism mm -hmm. in Canada, right? Yes. Because it doesn't matter which party is in, they mm -hmm. still carry on the tradition of racism, right? In in these different ways. I'm just looking at some of the comments that we've been getting, folks. Um, two individuals are pointing out that the streaming happens in Nova Scotia. Okay. Um, so, because we had said earlier that it only happens in Ontario. Mm -hmm. And then um, a friend of mine is pointing out that in Mississauga, she was told that she should do general when she wanted to do advanced. Um, so 
this this has been going on for years. And one of the things I want to talk about is the is the impact, because we can see it in these reports where we talk about you know graduation levels and all of that. But what about the 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 the, the, the psychological impact? Because I was talking to a friend of mine today and she's like, oh, what topic are you talking about? And I said, oh, racism in Canada. I'm talking about education. And she was literally triggered. She was literally triggered. She said, oh, my goodness, I wish I didn't ask you because I still have um, bad memories of what happened to me and my brother when we came to this country. Yes. And, and so, and so the day I ask you, does your friend have kids? Because what happens is when we were, when we were here, we were we were some of us was first generation, we're first generation or immigrant um, immigrant uh, kids, right? And so our parents didn't understand the system. They didn't go through the system when they were back home, wherever they were coming from. They had teachers that looked like them, and they had teachers who cared about them and was really into was vested had a vested interest in the in their education. Here we were just, you know, off of, um, I think they, they, you guys said 1965 was a, was a, um, they had. Uh, was a the yeah, and 1977 was when they started to legally allow for some changes, right? Yes, mm -hmm. and, and and we were in school during that time. So the, our parents did not take into consideration and perhaps they didn't know that we were being taught by people who really didn't like us and didn't yeah. have their best interests at heart. But today, your friend, she went through the system. She had such a terrible experience. What I would like to see is uh, the, the, the Black parents becoming... Having having more to do with their and, and standing up for their kids more because just as what we went through when I speak to the kids I don't have any kids myself but when I speak to the kids who are in the system they're going through the exact same thing that we're going that we had gone through I just list some of the stuff and and it's the same so don't believe that there has been any change if you are triggered could you imagine how your child is triggered every single day spending eight hours a day with people who who are not who don't have their best interests at heart and then i'm going to um, talk about the black teachers that are there right unfortunately some of us are going to because we've bought into the system we bought into the idea that we might not be good enough that we're going to uphold although we're black teachers we're still going to uphold the this this racist system we're still going to um try and suspend black youth we're probably going to expect more from them we're going to be a bit embarrassed of them acting up and not recognizing that they're acting up because they don't feel a sense of belonging and instead you know send them to the office and treat them the same way that we were treated when we were going to school so both the teachers the black teachers and the parents we, we have to they have to take charge they have to take charge of the situation mm -hmm. yeah I, I i agree with that because um I know also too to add to what you said, Karen, it's, it wasn't just our parents who didn't know, but I know uh, coming from the Caribbean, our parents at that time, there are two folds. There is that idea of respecting power. So you respect the teacher, teach, right? Teachers are highly respected in the Caribbean. So whatever the teacher mm -hmm. said about your child, that they must have some validity, Mm. Even though you should know your child, but again, it's the respect that they, the parent had. Yeah. Um, it's a power structure. It's so, a power yeah. structure, which is also within that dynamic of the systematic. Um, and also in terms of the um, the impact, um, I wanted to say two things very quickly. Um, in terms of the impact, first, before I say the impact, um, one of the, stu the Stephen Lewis report that Karen mentioned, and I always remember, was in terms of the visibility of more Black teachers. And... That was one of the, 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 the conditions that I felt was met to the largest degree because when we were going to school, to have a black teacher was almost, it was, uh, it was, it, it was on, uh, like, it was like we came home and talked about it during the dinner table. Guess what, mom? Guess what, mommy? We had a, a, a black teacher today. Or guess what they, or my sister will run out of their class to come to our class. Oh, guess what, our teacher, the supply teacher is black. So that has been changed. But again, as Karen said, and I'm not being hard on black teachers because I know there are black teachers who do advocate, but I, I don't think they're advocating enough because if 30 years later we could still be talking about this, there's a kind of complacency that I'm seeing that black teachers have taken. And in terms of the impact, 
Um, the impact, I, I think, is tremendous. People don't want to hear this because we don't like to talk about environmental determinism. Um, if you're in an environment that tells you that you're not worth worth wild, you're not smart, you're not bright, we all know the effect. Because we have this idea that when I got the chance to do my PhD, so that means you can do it. I know that's not true because I know why I was able and my siblings, why we were able to go on further. However, I remember seeing distinctly in my generation in the 80s and early 90s, the guys who were product of basic, some of the guys who were the product of basic who had to drop out of school early. And I know people are not going to like to hear this. But the guys who dropped out early, a lot of those guys ended up becoming drug dealers. They didn't, they were, they felt, and I, we spoke to some of these guys. And I'm not talking in terms of relationship, but I mean in terms of, you know, your friends. And you, you asked them, so they were, they didn't have the self-esteem to even go and learn a trait. Some of them end up dead because I could think of guys who died, right? Because of the trait they picked up. And it wasn't because they were naturally just bad men. And these, but this is the type of impact that we have that systematically affects us and impacts us. And then I could go on in terms of the, uh, what the impact that it had on the woman, but I'm just looking at it in terms of the psychological impact. Not all of us are able to, say, not all of us are able to, to, to have that um, the self-esteem because streaming takes away your self-esteem. If you're not in a, in, in a class that is telling you that you could go to uh, you be, be a doctor or a lawyer, or you don't even have the notion, yeah. because it's not just about telling you, you don't even have the notion, but you're being told that you cannot be, what else you're gonna be? If you look at the, mm -hmm. if you look during that period, then a the high school dropout of black men, and where some of those black men ended up, you, I know some of these people are saying, ah, oh, but I wasn't a drug dealer. We're not gonna personalize this. We're gonna look at it from a systemic, structural level, and how that environmental determinism affects, it, right? This is what uh, racism does. So that's what I mean in terms of the impact. For sure, and then and talking about the economic impact as well. <laughs> Not to say that um, trade workers cannot make money and people who go to college cannot make money, but if people were told that what they wanted to do, that they weren't good enough to do it and they could not do it, and they might not have had any interest in doing in doing trade, a lot of a lot of people dropped out of school. You know, we had a dropout rate of over fifty percent. And so when people drop out, the the job perspective that they have is is way less. Uh, yeah, I mean, you already know that even a, a black woman with a master's degree will be making less money than a white person with a high school degree. So yeah. could you imagine how much money a, a black person who has dropped out of high school is making? Mm -hmm. So it definitely had an economic impact on our community as it probably was Ooh. meant to. Yeah. And, and what I don't want um, folks to lose either is that there is a, a collective impact of all these racist practices on our young people right so we're talking about streaming but also having a school safety officer also having what we can identify as a school to prison pipeline where this zero tolerance thing that they brought into to the system where um most likely our people are the ones that are going to be given the suspensions and detentions and kicked out most likely they're the ones who are going to try to seek out. And I, and I would argue, um, and, and don't take this flippantly, I would argue that the, the, the gentleman that is doing drug deals probably wanted to be a business person, probably wanted to go and do an MBA and, you know, is doing what he can with what he has, right? So there are so many instances where it's a compounded effect on mm -hmm. us and it has... I think generational impact, and I think um, you, you're right, economic impact and more. And we're seeing it now. We're seeing it now, even in communities. Um, uh, I guess we in, the, in in Canada we wouldn't call them projects, but we're they're subsidized housing. Uh, we, we're seeing that in terms of the cycle of um, single parenting. All of this compounds, as you said, these things don't work within a vacuum where people just wake up one day and say, "I want to be a bad guy." And I just want to, and this is not to, because I know sometimes the successful um, black people, um, whatever that success means to us, uh, we might, because we're doing well and we're in our comfortable neighborhood and, and so far, we might write it off and say, well, they're just black. And, and they're just, that, that's just who they are. But we have to look at it collectively. These things do not just happen in a, in a vacuum. And these things are like a domino effect. So if you're going to have a system that tells you that you cannot, 
or not even just a stack cannot a system that puts you into a particular direction because i um, i found this quote but i can't find it but it, I, I found a quote but i'm trying to look for it and it was i thought it was a really nice quote it was just a way in which streaming the way it shapes your entire life if you're not able to um if you're not able to you know escape that um metaphorical crack so to speak, right and it can very much slipping it within that crack because you were mentioning in terms of prison to pipeline it's not a coincidence that a lot of our young um, black males are incarcerated these in when we talk about uh police uh, not police when we talk about um shootings incarceration all these problems were in existence when we were uh, in the 80s and the 90s and a lot of it is connected to the ways in which they, they you know within the systemic ways in which they were educated within an education system because that is where it starts it starts within the family and it starts with the education the schools because you spend the most time in your family and you also spend the most time at school so therefore i, I noticed that we're always um, blaming the families yes your parents of course have an influence and they do have responsibility for, responsibility for their children so i'm not going to take that away they need to be into their children's education but also what's happening when you're, you're somebody else is watching your child right for another eight hours that's a long time to be away from your parents you know eight mm -hmm. hours and in terms of how they're affecting you psychologically sorry go ahead yeah. and well, sorry go ahead go, go ahead Karen. go ahead i was just um about to say that um working you know i have worked in the school system and i also worked in the suspended school system and um one thing i realized is that um sometimes the the teachers know the the kids better than the parents do and this is, this is across the board for all um, students. You know, the you know the the parents or the students are at home uh, sleeping for maybe eight hours. You know, their parents might come home five six o'clock after work, and so their teachers and their peers at school spend more time with them. And so, um, you know, unfortunately, our t our um, our children they are forming their self esteem and their self confidence at school. And so uh, the, the, the various, you know, issues that they're facing at school is bringing down their self-esteem. And I'm not quite sure that the, I'm not quite sure that the, the, the parents understand that. And so to yeah. say that it's the parents' fault, I'm not quite sure that that's fair. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, so we, we, we don't necessarily want to blame the people who are victimized by the system. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> you know, um, but one of the things that I, um, two things that I want to address. One, I feel um, that that is maybe avoided or not talked about is the idea of low expectation and the impact that that has generationally on, on a society and on a group of people or on an ethno, mm -hmm. ethnocultural group. If, mm -hmm. if the system has put you in a spot where there isn't much we expect from you, yeah. right? Where else do you land but at the bottom? And when you're going to get a job, you're going to job interviews, uh, people, especially with the black men. Um, my my friend is a teacher at the Peel District School Board, and he was in the hallway uh, telling students to go back to class, to go to class. And some of the students went to the office and complained and said, there's a strange man in the hallway telling us to go <laughs> class and we're scared i know that if this if he was not a black man that would have come but the students doesn't they don't expect him they don't expect a, a, a young black man to be a teacher they just don't and that's that's what the expectation you know we, we end up getting looked down upon and we could say well we don't care how people view us but it's not just how they view us but when we're turned when we're discriminated against because of that when we go to uh, to get jobs, it's like, well, we're not quite sure that you could do this because it's known that you know, 50% of you drop out of uh, uh, school, that 34% of you get suspended. It's you know, it it pathologizes our community. Our our community is definitely pathologized. Yes, so, and to add to that, Karen, and even in terms of the neighborhood you're coming from. So if the school is located within a particular neighborhood, that expectation drops even lower. So if you're going to a school in Jane Finch, if you're going to a school in Willow Ridge, in that area, 
or any community that is put like you know that you have a, a high um, population of black people then that's also going to be the perception and also too the teachers know it already if you're going to be teaching students in um, basic or general you're going to teach them according to so you're only going to give them so much right versus if you're going to be preparing them for academic because i remember when i was in advanced and doing advanced literature we were doing color it we were doing things that would be done in first year university go to a general literature class and they're only doing the, the, the very the minimal go to basic and they're even they're, they're not even doing shakespeare in, in, in basic literature right so again the teachers are also the ones who are giving right and so that expectation so i don't expect them to do no much or do much so therefore if i go into if i'm teaching students and preparing them for maybe college because this is a basic then i don't really have to uh, their expectation is even is, is lower and a lot of those trade school too um Danae, just very quickly um some of those trade schools that they that came out of the streaming that um in, in, i guess in jamaica because I, I was i've taught here in jamaica as well where they will have technical schools in young men made more um who did like say basic and they managed to go to those technical schools i don't know how much technical schools they have now they still have the westway and um they had those technical schools they would offer them also very minimal in terms of trade and uh, unfortunately even the statistic would show you that um the dropout rate within those technical schools were low and they're oftentimes um marred with violence um because that's an issue as well in some of those schools uh, where you have gang related violence that disrupts and it, it gets very ugly in terms of this the, right with the ecosystem of the way with racism work because I remember some of those trade schools and those trade schools were not yes they were offering in the trade so you know but some of them did not finish it and then the, also the, the violence and I see that in some of the schools now where you have those um, types of issues yeah yeah and um, we we hit the one hour mark and we seem to still be live on yeah. Facebook <laughs> so <laughs> We'll see how that goes um, until, <laughs> until I'm given any other indication. Um, but you know, just in case, let us move move it to the the solution or progressive or what do we want to see coming out of um, you know these deep dives into the racist systems. So for me, um, as as Karen started, it's not just good enough to end streaming. Mm -hmm. um, especially when your plan is to end it next year. So we don't know what could happen next year. It could change your out, right? <laughs> so, so it is not just good enough to say, oh, we're going to cut out grade nine streaming. There is a more robust conversation that needs to happen systemically about why were you doing that in the first place? Why were you identifying um, pr um, black youth and persons of color as the people that you think you should redirect their path from mm -hmm. as early as early as I know elementary school based on the stories my aunt told me as an elementary school teacher and and into grade nine. And then I just want to um, correct just a quick correction on the streaming. I, I know we like to lump um, racialized group everybody into one. But when we were going to, I don't know how it is now, but streaming didn't affect Asian yeah. students. Yeah. Asian students yeah, Asians, um, Asian students, the expectation the was the perception, smart. Perception. The, per the expectation of them, they were smart. Um, South Asian students, um, they were smart. Um, there is a, um, a, a slight socioeconomic that might fit in within um, the streaming where um, persons coming from, again, I spoke about it earlier, a particular community. So you might see a, like a, maybe a poor white child in a basic group. Um, so there's a little socioeconomic dimension to it, but not, I know there were, there has been articles written about it. Um, however, um, I would, I would not, if, if we're, if I'm going to engage the conversation, um, as you said, because you're rightfully so that we need to speak about streaming before we go further, we cannot, um, bring in, uh, or else we're going to lose out. It's again because every time we bring in personal um, other racialized groups that are specific to black black community, we tend to just lose focus because uh, okay, well if it's not it was not just black people, it's also um, this group. Because I remember once I did a, a, a paper very similar to what we're talking about, culturally relevant material using in classrooms, 
Um, because that's something else that needs to be changed in terms of curricula. And somebody said to me, well, we could say the same thing about Portuguese, right? So we have to be very careful how- the What, what, what about isms? The what about yeah, the isms? About, yeah, I like that. <laughs> what about ism, right? So yes. we have to just- Yeah, no, and, and Lisa, I'm happy you, you did that um, pause because I guess for a minute there, I was getting very um, stush and forgetting myself. <laughs> um, <laughs> to be clear, I am the person who will say it is black. We're talking about black issues. Yes, you know I know. <laughs> so, so, so let me catch back myself and, and realize that the conversation we're having here, folks, yes, racism in Canada affects everybody. And yes. if if you ignore what is happening with black persons in the system, you will also do so at your own detriment because these people that you think are outside of you live among you and these people who you disenfranchise will want to rebel these people who you disenfranchise will want to act out on how a system treated them because everybody becomes the enemy at that point right so yes it is very clear that we have to speak of it in terms of black i'm looking at some of the comments um chatter uh, you know, and, and really know Dr. Chatter, she wants to point out that parents have to step up more. And mm -hmm. then in, in the conversation, um, um, number of persons were saying to her, but not all parents have the skills. So in talking mm -hmm. about solutions, I want to also have us have an empowering conversation about how can parents engage with a, a broken system. Um, and then um, Neil is pointing out that the Peel District School Board Review 2020 and the investigators report of the Peel District School Board by Arlene Huggins are good resources for persons to examine um, further. So I, I had looked through that um the report and there were a number of um, directives that were uh, supposed to be put in place and some of them hasn't been. And, um, you know, it's really important that the language that we use and also the language that the, um, the Toronto District School Board and the different school board uses to communicate with parents, that, these, that, that this language is accessible. And oftentimes it's not. So there, there are people in, within the community who might be able to help other parents. Um, some of the parents don't, um, some of them are still new here or even though they went through the system, um, it's it's intimidating, right? Uh, the, the you know reading maybe through five or six pages of directives that um, where they're using big words, it's not it's not accessible. And so um, we can start asking ourselves, what are some things that um, people who are um, educated or people who are passionate about um, about this can they can they form groups to help other parents who might not be able to help themselves? You know, I was talking about some parents who are embarrassed and who, who don't want to speak out because they're afraid that um, there's going to be retaliation about against their kids. Their kids are spending, um, you know, a whole year, a whole academic year with a teacher, and so they're afraid. So what kind of advocacy groups can we form to help parents and, and Lisa will know, you know, quite a few times we've gone to the schools, you know, we've, when the African Legal Clinic was about, we would call the African Legal Clinic to, you know, make a call to the school to, um, to speak to a, a principal or a um, superintendent to find out what's happening with one of our Black children, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's important for us to, to uh, build resources for ourselves. Mm -hmm. For our for our community members because the truth is as neil and um the other person point out a lot of a lot of people just simply cannot do it by themselves it's intimidating and yeah. today, i just want to say uh, you kind of brought up um you were alluding to maybe an inquest into why the system was as it was so why streaming in the first place and why were so many black students um, streamed? Uh, I found a statistics where it said 47% of black um, students take applied. They're in the applied stream and this is the middle college stream, whereas 20% of non-black students take um, the um, applied stream. Now, mm -hmm. somebody standing up from the outside might think, oh my gosh, then this shows that black people might not be smart enough and this might be the problem. 
when in fact we know that it's not the problem. We mm. know that it's systemic racism and there are always sy systems and, and, and racism built into the structure. We have to make sure that whatever structure is, is put into place, whatever new structures, that, that racism is not built into that. And a good way of doing that, I think, is starting with an inquest to make sure that this mm -hmm. never happens again. Yeah, and and I think um, a conversation needs to happen at the teacher's college level. I was just about to say that. Go, go ahead. <laughs> you can jump in because you, you, yeah. you, you've taught and are still teaching. <laughs> but um, at the teacher's college level, the, the student teacher who has already developed stereotypes about Black kids, who is entering the system a system that is already broken and set up, set up against um, the success of, of our kids mm -hmm. needs to be told and this needs to be interrogated in, in their teaching practice that there is this issue, that there is this systemic decades long streaming, that there's this systemic um, need and interest in bringing in security and resource officers, that there's this, there's this systemic um, prison prison and school relationship that they should be tackling in their pedagogy so you you can speak to it lisa in in a in a in in better words <laughs> no, no, you're doing a, you do, do a perfect job um, my point is was close it was about the teachers it was within the, that context that when you have the interventions um one we have to be careful that when we have intervention we're not having tokenism so we can't have these token Solution, if I could use a term, because a lot of the ways in which the internet that has happened within the Toronto District School Board, I, I could speak to that, I, to my estimation, has been tokenism. So, um, for example, I, I don't no longer work there, so it's okay. <laughs> um, I remember the program that I was working in, like the, the area, and this area, this particular area, was again for to really determine students' ability. They were able to function in the English speaking classroom because it was really screening um, students new to the country from the Caribbean and up they threw in Africa there. So I would um, test them in terms of their literacy skills, their use of Jamaican or Trinidadian um, Creole, et cetera, and literacy. So while I was there, and this is why I'm talking about the tokenism, you still had um, teachers who were um, su suggesting or putting these students to get tested. And Dene, every time I got students file, I always knew the students who did not need it to be tested. And I'll give you a very quick example. I remember once um, when I just started, I got a child from a prep school in Jamaica. And um, the file was saying, you know, her English is this, her English is that. And I had to speak to the mother before, but I couldn't give the mother any heads up. The mother spoke like Jamaican standard English. So right away, her mother told me that she went to a prominent prep school in Jamaica. So I'm thinking, it's highly unlikely a child whose parents, like the mother I spoke to, and who went to this prominent prep school in, 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 in um, Jamaica, is going to need this language assessment. In Marky, there were a few students who did need it because they were coming from an environment where they only spoke the, the Patwa. So they did need some um, um, rem um, like, uh, I guess, um, remedial English. Vinay, when I went to test this child, the child spoke standard English. The child didn't even use one speck of spot patois. You would not believe this child came from Jamaica. So anyhow, when I did the report, I was told one side, oh, um, first of all, my report came out as an advocacy. So therefore it was like, why are you advocating for this child? You're only supposed to be speaking to her English or math, whatever. I said, no, there's no way I could be in this job. Because first of all, this job, I'm far, I'm far than concerned, it's, it's advocacy. Because if I'm going to get a child that can speak standard English and has no indication that there's any need to put it in a remedial um, language development class. And for me, that was very tokenism. So I, while, and, I, and there were more cases that I saw like this. So there has to be a way in which their teachers need to be synthesized, like in terms of pedagogy, synthesized in terms of of the language, even in terms of linguistics, because you have children even born, and that was another a story. I even I even had to assess students who were born in Canada, <laughs> right? I had to assess students who were born in Canada, and these teachers, when they would get the report, they would be frightened, like, um, but that's 
you're not supposed to be going back. I said, no, I have perception. to. Be. Yeah, the perception that just because you're coming from this particular neighborhood or this or the or one of the parents may have had a, a thick patwa accent, that therefore that is why the child is gonna have functional mm -hmm. some you know incompetency in, 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 um, in English. So going back to the pedagogy, this pedagogy is going to have to be in the teachers' college. It's not. It's, they're gonna have to be an anti like a real. Um, anti-racist like anti curriculum, like anti-racist pedagogy that has to be embedded within the teacher's college. They can't just use their their sense, you know, their awareness of culture during multicultural um, week or Black History Month. This has to be something that is a long-term, right? It has to be something long-term. And I, and I find that was one of the issues that I had uh, with the Toronto District School Board where um, they did not, yeah, they talk about racism but it wasn't like an anti-racist um racism that they use right in order to synthesize the teachers to listen because racism is not just about um there's so many elements we were talking about streaming there's language and i keep bringing up language because that was a strong area for me in terms of the ways in which students were streamed and also disadvantaged because of so-called um, speaking another language, and we see that ESL is not a. It's not a. <clears throat> excuse me. We see students who go into ESL from other country, and Karen, you remember this. They were still able to take advance, whereas once Black students did any form of, they weren't put into ESL. They were put into communications class. Once they had to do any form of, of language, yeah, knocked, knocked out of advance. Were not, uh, whereas Asian students who didn't speak. Mm -hmm. They were Asian students who didn't speak fluent English. They were still able to take advanced science and math. Mm. So these are all the perceptions that come with also you spoke earlier. So when we go back to pedagogy now, this is what teachers need to be an anti-racist pedagogy that makes them fully aware of the different forms of how racism works uh, within the classroom. Yeah, and, and I think that we're perhaps being kind when we say that they need this, you know, anti-racism uh, work and they need to, you know, get back to the pedagogy of, um, you know, learning to to work with uh, with black students. In, in actual fact, this is purposeful. What has happened to black students, what happened to us when we were in school is purposeful. The streaming is, has been, a, it has been an effort, a direct effort to hold our to hold us back to hold our kids back and to prevent us from from getting good jobs to prevent us from um, moving into better neighborhoods <laughs> right and to, to to prevent us from feeling comfortable in Canada it is it, it is it is purposeful you know we could we could look at all the whys all the whys but the truth is it's it's to contribute to systemic racism this yeah. is how to, but this is how you keep a people down. Yeah. And education, and what better way to start than with education? With education. And, and with their young minds. Yeah, mm -hmm. Edu education is is a key entry point for racism. Like, you're, you're, you're literally learning racist curriculum. Mm -hmm. You're yeah. literally in a racist system. It, you're surrounded by it. Um, I mean, mm -hmm. it, is, it is a perfect wonder that so many of us have come through these systems, yourselves who have gone through all the arcs of the system to be sitting here today, um, you know, as successful um, professional women, because the, 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 the odds were stacked against you. The odds are stacked against our black youth um, in, in the education system. And as, as I said, we want solutions, um, chatter, Chata, Tanya, and um, and Elaine are having a conversation about the parents and the role of the parents. And you know, Chata is saying the parents need to have more presence, need to make their presence felt. Um, so, and and Elaine was speaking to what we spoke about earlier, Lisa, about you know immigrant parents, you know, respect teacher, you know, teacher what teacher said, teacher right, you know. Like I remember my my um my parents. Um, my aunt who raised me telling me that teacher was given permission to beat them on behalf of their parents back home. So imagine mm -hmm. if they bring a child to Canada and the, and the teacher say, your kid no good enough for you. They don't believe, they believe. It's true, but guess what, Danae? The, you know, and I'm not, I'm not going to get on um, the Black parents, but most of the students here now, as I had said before, they're, they're, they're first and second generation. So the, the parents know 
The parents have gone through the system. And um, I've heard some parents say, oh, you know, racism is changing because you see the kids playing with each other. You see the black kids and the white kids and you see the Asian kids and all of them are getting along so well. And, you know, in when my, my, my black, my, my kids, they have white friends. When we were growing up, we had the same thing. And, and, and yet it goes into a cycle, it doesn't change. So yeah. I would really like the parents to wake up. You are, you're putting, you are sending your kids to the slaughterhouse to be slaughtered when you send them to when you send them to school. When you don't go to their, um, their parent teacher's night, and I can't blame some parents sometimes because you go to the parent teacher's night and you're spoken down to, right? You, yeah. uh, they might not um, answer your questions the the, the way your uh, your massa massa come back. Yeah, and yeah. remember also, Karen. Um, um, that is an excellent point. I have to jump in. Um, I remember having friends who, as parent of single mother, where they would bring uh, a male partner with them to parent meeting. I had two yeah. friends. I had two friends who did that because they didn't want to be seen as single parent because they know that if. Because there are, there are cases where teachers would make fun of um, black students having different last names. I know that yeah. for a fact. Like I've, I've heard it and, I, and I've been there in the situation. And there are parents who carry that shame because again, we're still trying to live up to the respectability politics of how, what is Canadian. Mm -hmm. And when you have um, going to, you, all of a sudden you come into this society and it's telling you that to be a single mother, there's a problem. And this is not to, uh, to, to take away the responsibility from the parents because we know but th that parents are responsible for their children's education. But that's not the topic here. The topic here is how do we look at the system? But, so but also, can ahead. I say, ultimate, ultimately, we know that the parents want the best for their kids. It's not that the parents are lazy because the parents work and the, the parents provide for their kids. Sometimes they want the best for their jobs. kids. Yeah. They, 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 some of them have two jobs. They, they want their kids to be able to, to fend for themselves when they grow up. So just like we're not going to believe that our kids are 47% um, of them have to take general because they're just not smart enough to take um, the academic, we must believe also that the parents, that 99% of the parents want the best for their, their, their kids. So now it's just what, what do we give them? What, um, what tools do we give them in order for them to be able to advocate for their kids? Because parents, like if I if I walk away with anything today, whatever I said, I'd like parents to 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 get into their kids' education by mm -hmm. any means necessary. And mm -hmm. so if it's um if it's going and visiting the school, if you have time, if it's looking into your in your care in your parent your kids' um, book, um, mm -hmm. I know you know I have a, a cousin who allowed her kids to to take. Um, not academic what, what is it called applied because they want because they just felt like it that is not you know in canada you make the kids do what they want to do and you know kids know best no because no other groups of people are allowing their kids to make decisions to make education decisions for themselves your kids are 15 16 17 and 18 years old in high school they are not allowed to make those decisions for themselves you look at them and you look at their ability and you yes you could talk to them and, and figure out what are some of the things they want to do where are some of their strengths but they do not get to choose uh, to do applied just because it's easy. They don't get to choose to to go to say film school or to just say that they're gonna concentrate on basketball because that's what they wanna do. No, because that hasn't worked for our community and it will not work. Our community is 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 way is too behind, you know, and um, we 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 can look towards Nigerian communities and other African communities as well that um that somehow you know, they 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 face the same discrimination as we do, and they're they're able to instill in their kids um, uh, education, right? And they're able to um, to take the reins of their their kids' education and say, okay, this is what you're gonna do. As as Caribbean um, parents, we need to be able to do the same thing. We can't sit back. We cannot afford to sit back and make another generation of kids come up. Because I keep telling people, we hear a lot about AI. We hear AI, computer technology. Your kids will, you know, 
some of us, we were able to go out and get um, factory jobs and get non-skilled labor jobs. Those jobs are going to be no more. We're not going to have non-skilled labor jobs. So your kids have to be skilled. In fact, they have to be highly skilled. So after they go to college and university, they have to go to college and university again. And they're going to have to learn highly skilled stuff that they might have to start learning when they're in high school. They have mm -hmm. to do math. Mm -hmm. They have to do science. They have to do technology. And that's it. There's no, I don't, I, I, I don't want to. We can't accept that from our kids. We but, can't make um, them rule us. I, I think in terms of empowering, in empowering our um, parents who may watch this back, um, we, we need to um, approach this from a village approach, you know, guys. Mm -hmm. the, there are resources among us. There are some who are strong advocates. There are some who are good tutors. Um, the JCA, um, when there wasn't COVID, the JCA has a Saturday morning, um, um, we call it a homework program, right? The, all these community groups um, and bodies, they can help right. to resource our students so that they are in a better position to succeed, even within a broken system. And yes, there are some parents who can advocate and some who can't and some who don't care, to be honest, because remember, we talked about the cycle. If mm -hmm. you are coming from a dropout cycle, you're probably also going to come from a single parent cycle. Right. So yeah. how do we support those parents who either from stigma or who from discomfort don't attend the meetings because they know that, you know, nobody going to listen to them mm -hmm. or don't attend the meetings because they don't feel equipped to mm -hmm. to advocate on behalf of their students because i'm i'm not going to down on immigrant parents because my aunt is an immigrant and she mm -hmm. she took off time and walk into the school and fight for her kids like it's sometimes it's a fight to make sure that your kid is not disenfranchised so mm -hmm. similarly um i think we need we need some community based approach and and mm -hmm. and, and village based yeah, Danae, it's funny, again, you're, I have it written down here because that's what I wanted to touch on in terms of resources. Yeah. Um, when we looked at the segregated schools, these schools were under-resourced badly um, in terms of, in fact, there are schools, black schools, segregated schools, didn't have libraries at all. So you see how education, again, becomes so vital. So there are no libraries. Um, books were not even in good condition. Um, room sizes were extremely small to fit in all 40 students. But my point is here is, um, you talked about a village and community. There were two children who were forced to stay home, and there are stories of women who had the resource, I would say in terms of knowledge, and they would have their own local school, those little black schools, and they were able to use their resources to facilitate a community. So to this didn't happen in everywhere, but there were stories, there had been stories within Southern West, um, South, um, Western um, Ontario and Nova Scotia where there were little schools that were run by or operated by black women uh, mainly, and they were able to offer that, that community um, resource where they had to, they had no choice, right? So they had to, so bring that into um, 2020 um, Canada. Again, there needs to be, because I, 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 and I'm not trying to, I don't want people leaving here thinking, oh, we're making an excuse for parents. But we also have to remember that these parents are also, um, I don't like the word victim, but they're also being impacted by racism, even in their workplace, right? Even within um, going to the bank, right? Yeah. So they're, 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 so we, we have to understand psychologically how racism is playing out within the community and even in terms of the family. So yeah. why say that, okay, it's not the, about the parents. Yes, I know the parents are, 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 are responsible, but we have to also remember, and you, you said it well, right? Those who have the skills, because there are parents who are intimidated by the school who might not even have the, the educational level because they were streamed and they don't feel that confident themselves in order to, not just to, to, to see. And we saw this during the, the quarantine where there are parents who, and this is, one that does a, this is not just a developing third world, um, country thing where there are parents who can't help their kids with their homework. So we have to think about the socioeconomic and intertwine the class, the race, and also because those parents who are advocating for their children the most are oftentimes parents who are going to be have a different level of education, a different level of confidence, 
And of course, I'm not, again, people are going to say, oh, only educated people. No, the reality of it is we have to think about also the class structure and also the socioeconomic the community, the neighborhood that these parents live in. Because I think, yes, we, the parents, we know it's their responsibility, but we also have to be mindful of the other, right, the racism that they also have to be facing at home. Because I remember even um, my mother, uh, when my mother, uh, when she, first of all, my mother had trust in the school system. Um, that's far, right, coming from Jamaica. And it wasn't until later on when my mother started to see the racism in her own workplace when my mother started to understand what we were going through. And okay, so Lisa, yes. I can say to you, you know, it is what it is. The fact yeah. is, the, um, uh, we're not making excuses, but we're talking about why in which the uh, the parents can't do yeah, but we have to think of We have to think of interventions. We have to think of interventions. Exactly. So, so, so it's like... It's like so we all know, so, you know, there's racism, yeah, there's racism in, the in the society, there's racism in the school. Yes. What can the, what can the, what can the, we know what they're up against, but what yeah. can they do about it, and even it with what they're up against? This is where the resourceful parent, the parent who has, we can't be selfish with our knowledge. So someone like a Danae, someone like you, right? How are, and I'm not putting you guys on the spot. When I have no children, nobody don't want to hear from me. I, myself, <laughs> my sister, but I'm just using an example. The parents who are able to, because you know the thing is, um, Danae, the parent who can advocate for their children, they're advocating only for their children. And that is the point I'm trying to make, the point in terms of where does that... It's a collective. Mean, the collective. collective. So because I, in my time, I don't have any children, and I could tell you how many times, I can't tell you how many times that I have gone, and these children didn't have to be in my family where I've gone to represent because the parents were too intimidated. I remember going to one uh, where a, 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 a guidance counselor right in front of our face, the teacher was saying she couldn't be a nurse. Why doesn't she do um, PSW? Big up nurse, big up PSW. Mm -hmm. And the mother was not able to, she didn't feel confident enough to address that teacher. So I had to go. So that is what I mean. While you're advocating, because we all do this, there's a kind of selfishness. And that is my point. So we and, have and, and I still ask the question, and it's a hard question. Of doing it, we should, you know, as you, as you said, it takes a village to raise a, 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 a community. Is that's there it. Anything that so somebody with low self esteem, low self esteem, or feel bad about themselves, don't have the know how to all of a sudden just get up tomorrow morning and start advocating. There's a lot of advocates in our community, just like the teachers. Why, why are those same teachers in the the, the, uh, the education system in in Canada? Why aren't they also advocating? I remember black teeth student um, guidance counselor in the Catholic school telling uh, my sister that she couldn't take a particular um, because again, as a black woman, she had expectations. So we also have to, and she knows better because she's um, educated. So it's somebody's not gonna, phone is ringing. Oh, it's my phone. <laughs> so I'm not. I'm not saying that parents are not responsible, but it has to be realistic in terms of the ways in which um, you know racism affects um, parent or, or, or in a different way, or, or not how it affects. But we have to be mindful of those parents who can and those parents who really cannot, because that is the reality of, of, of our society. Not everybody has the know-how and, and, and is able to navigate right navigate the system so those who can because that is what i'm seeing people are just individually navigating for their children oh my child did it. so i'm going to do this for my child why not get start a, a a group a parent group so, Lisa, I, I would me. like us to come up with something that the parents can do themselves at least so hang on okay. i would like us to do to come up with something because We've been we've been talking about you know what others could do for the parents you know us getting together because we're coming up we're coming up with different solutions right what are some of the solutions that the parents can do for themselves because the truth is they have agency right so what are some things and and they're gonna and there are gonna be times when they have to do some things for themselves what are some of the things Danae what are some of the things that the parents could do for themselves so. So here's the thing. I, I, I'm not a parent, so I'm not going to pretend to give parents advice, but I'll say this much. <laughs> Having been a child one time, um, parents have to be interested. You have to be interested in the outcome that your child will have. 
And so it starts there. It really starts there. You, mm -hmm. If you're interested and you can't advocate, you'll find the advocate. If you're interested and you can't go to the meeting, you'll find somebody who can accompany you to the meeting. If you're yeah. interested and, 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 and you don't know what this new curriculum they're bringing is, you'll find somebody who can read it and explain it to you. If you're interested, I think it starts there for the parent, right? Mm -hmm. um, what I also want us to talk about, though, is um you're saying something karen you're you're silent no, he's chatting away okay you're <laughs> not hearing you karen she had a, hmm? you, you were on mute so. no you're talking you're having your own conversation oh i'm on mute because i'm i'm sorry there's some things going around here and <laughs> okay. so i put you on mute so that you won't hear it okay so so yeah so i'm saying you know it starts for me with a parent being interested in, in the outcome that the child has. Um, and in many cases, we'll hear parents say that they want better for their child than what they had. So start there. If you want better for your child than you had, and you know what you faced in the system, or you've heard the stories and maybe you didn't even face it, you just, you know, you just never like school. But advocate, um, access the help. There is definitely a lack of resources in a number of our um, types of our schools. But do you know, do you know that the libraries right now, Toronto libraries are very well resourced across, yeah. across the city. It is, it is good to get acquainted with the library. Go to the library with your kid. You may not understand their homework and you may not can do homework with them, but maybe you can take out a book because the library have a love book and storybook. You can take out a book <laughs> and sit with the child in the library setting, um, access um you know tutoring tutoring for your 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 kids there are free tutoring programs in the community that your kid can access as well if you can't help them right and fight back don't take it for granted that mm -hmm. the stream is the right thing don't accept it if your child is uncomfortable talk up even if your child is not speaking up you speak up don't take it for granted that this is how it has to be because many generations before that took it for granted you see the outcomes now you see the generational impact on people yeah. who who just took what the system said to them and took the assault that the system did on them exactly. um the other thing that i i i want us to do is hold the system accountable it, all these reports and all these recommendations mean nothing if we don't hold those reports and recommendations up and say, this is what we want. And if it's not that we want, then we put in there what we want. Because the reality is, for me as a non-parent, I don't understand why there is a, a safety officer or a resource officer in any building. I don't understand at what level, at what level you lose control of students where you think you need to have a police walking the hall. I don't understand it. I cannot compute it mentally for me. I hear people tell me, you know, oh, you don't know some bad kids. You don't know, no, no, no. There's no bad kid. Mm -hmm. There is environment that engenders behavior. Yes. Right? And so if they're coming to you from an environment that's rough and you then layer on them the rest of the racism, then obviously they're going to be a bad kid in your class and they're going to be a bad kid in your school. But I know multiple black principals who have been called upon to go into certain schools because they can handle it. Why can't they handle it? Why? Because there's a cultural IQ. Mm -hmm. There is a, there's a, a language that the black person understands. There mm -hmm. is a struggle and oppression and, and a nuance that we know. So I advocate for us to hold the system accountable. And I advocate for those who are interested in teaching to fight. Because the system is also racist against teachers. They don't let them in. They, they have them on the supply list forever. Yeah. Or they mm -hmm. you know, them have to have a friend and a friend and a friend to get in. We haven't even begun to touch the surface on the racism in the education system. Because we, we, we've tonight spent the night really focusing on the, the lens of the student or, or from the lens of the student or the impact on the student. But the teachers themselves, the parents themselves, all of it um, piles on. And you're right, Karen, they need to wake up. But there's also, Danae, um another layer to this. I, I don't know if I'm going off track or what. But there's also another layer. There's a trust in the system that we have um, as black people, especially living in Canada. 
Um, because when we talk about racism, it's not just white people who are in denial. There are black people who also feel that they live in a better country. And that's what distinguished them. That is what distinguished them from an American. And there are black people who do have faith and believe in the system. There are black people right now who might think that what we're saying is our problem. It's just because we have Lego Pickney or bad parent and we start to pathologize the us, right? Because we're the problem or them just don't. And if because my child got to go to the best school, et cetera, she was in French emerge, et cetera. So there's also this level of trust that we have within the system, the systematic way in which uh, we, because of the way Canada narrates um, their uh, relationship with black people, it's very easy for Canada to, even when they talk about um, domestic worker, I know I'm, I'm not gonna go off, but even when they talk about domestic worker, in the way we vote, because we believe that, okay, this party brought in the domestic worker. They didn't tell us why and how, and how those workers were treated. They just told us that they brought them in. So we have this indebted, like we're kind of indebted to these uh, white people. So therefore we also, we, we, we can't vote for another party because this we is the party. Fight. We don't fight. So these are kind of the also um, challenges that we have to face because there are some black parents. I've, I've dealt with, um, even when I was told you about the language um, uh, issue, there are some black parents, there are some of those who were, are, they were too afraid to talk to the, um, the teacher because they told themselves they didn't speak English. And there are those who thought that the teachers and even within our generation who still believe in the system. They still want to believe, because it's easier to believe in the system because it makes you feel like you're part of it. So, because what we're doing right now, it's really putting us on the fringes, right, of, of the system. It's really putting us within the margin. So that is also an issue that we also have to engage. There, there, there are black parents who are just fine. Canada, great. Canada, the best country. But can they be... Can they be so fine with their student, with their kids being discriminated against? They're being they're being discriminated. No, but they're fine with themselves being discriminated too. Some people, if you say it's racism, they'll say, "Oh no, no, no. you're talking about racism." It's it, yeah. that's like they even no. get. I, I I see some of the conversation that goes on even on in, in social media. Anytime Canada is implicated, it's just. And, and we see this in Toronto too, when we go to these different sessions, it's the same people, because there, there's this idea that people really believe that America, it's, it's really happens in America. It doesn't, it, the, the, even the segregated schools that we talked about earlier, I'm sure people don't even know that Canada had segregated had no clue. schools, had no clue. Yeah. And this is that history of segregation is, is playing out right now in, in, in terms of the streaming. Yeah, and we, and, have, segre and we have segregated oh, resources. We have segregated, and segregated resources. And every, yeah, no, go so, ahead. Yeah. So I want to I wanna kind of wrap up. Um, mm -hmm. We have um, Neil Armstrong saying, Black parents are very active in the We Rise Together Community Advisory Council in the Peel District School Board. And they've held several events for parents. Um, I would say to Neil, thanks for the resource. And mm -hmm. I would say that I bet a lot of the Peel District School Board parents never took advantage of those events and mm. getting to know. And another thing, so, you know, because so, I, I come from a media lens, we don't promote properly. We don't promote, we don't share information properly. We don't, we don't, we don't, we don't, you know what I mean? Like we don't, we, we have a little nugget and we keep mm. it to ourselves or we keep it to our little friend circle and so on. But mm. the same um, bluster and energy that we can give a flyer for a party, we should be able to give for um, an engagement effort that is happening in the district school boards. The same excitement that we can do with a meme, we can post um, information for parents. Because again, I am advocating for a village approach because I'm, I'm all about collective right now in everything that we're talking about with racism in Canada and, 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 and tackling um, things from an anti-racist lens. I am for a collective approach to multiple, multiple solutions that, that we can come up with. And with this digital society that we're going into this technological world, there's still this digital apartheid because a lot of the information that are being shared on and, um, through social media and um, internet, et cetera, parents do not have access. And we have to be fair in terms of accessibility and how we're accessing information. And uh, again, I know it's a parent's um, responsibility and I'm not taking that away. I would be ridiculous to leave here. But there's, we have to think about the accessibility because um, here we have Neil just mentioned a, a parent group. How is, as accessible is that group? 
I know of incidents where parents will seek tutoring only for for them picnic, right? Yeah. Why not pull together and have, uh, like you mentioned, even if you can't go to the JCA, right? Because I, I I used to do tutoring and I used to tutor for this um two um black organ um black groups. Um, I think it was one of them was higher learning. I don't know if higher learning is still there. Um, suppose they can't afford to do that, right? Because not everybody could afford tutoring. That's a fact. But we have the JCA who offers free tutoring. Okay, how close is JCA to the person who lives? So this is again goes back to my point in terms of accessibility and knowing. So we, we have to look at it from and most we, layers. Yeah. And yeah, we, have but, use we have to use technology to our ad advantage as yes, well. Where, where possible. But here's the funny yeah. thing. Um, um, I'm now in healthcare. One of our um one of our patients came in and indicated that you know she was just we were just having loose conversation and in the loose conversation what came out of it was that her child has not been actually participating in school during this covid period mm. and instead of being aghast which i was internally i said so how is that what happened there and she said then when, when we must get um you know, laptop from and when we must do all this stuff. So there is definitely a segregation of resourcing. Um, um, and there is, you know, the JCA was offering laptops for parents who were in these situations. There was, there was quite a, a number of And a um, number of organizations. organizations. I know, like, I, I know the Tropicana's of the world. There are multiple organizations yeah. that do this work. Again, it comes back to, mm -hmm. are you interested and do you seek that resource or information? Sorry, oh, Karen, I think I cut that's you. Oh, sorry. No, I was saying, no, also, no. do you feel, are you part of the community? Because in the 70s, I remember, um, where, where you talk about collectivities and community, if a black man, um, I remember the first incident when they would have, um, I know this is not about policing, but just to show you the difference in terms of community. If some, well, I remember the incident with Donaldson, the, the marches were huge. There was, an, there was an issue in terms of mobilizing black people in the 70s and early 80s. So if you don't feel like a part of the community, or not feel a part, if you don't identify yourself in part of the, the community, you're not going to be aware of even some of these um, very things that you're talking about. Yeah, so that's also course. something as well. Like, are you... Are you, are you a, and, and to clarify too, though, these yeah. resources are being offered to everybody. You know, it's not Jamaican kids. It's yeah, you know, I know, I know. It's, it's yeah. everybody. So you know, at some point, we do have to hold people accountable to knowing, right? To 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 seeking information and trying to trying to get better for their for their kids. Um, at the same time, I also suggest that the programs that are out there need to do a better job of promotion. Um, you know, getting the word out there. Because there's 5 million, 50 million group on Facebook that you could be posting these these different um, information um, nuggets in. Um, there are, you know, there are just, t the technology is there um, as well. well as well as the old school way of putting a poster in the library that's okay. near the person. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like there's, there's, there are ways to get information out that I don't know that we're accessing. Um, but in terms of wrapping up guys, um, <laughs> you know, we're almost at a two hour mark, believe it or not. So mm -hmm. I don't want us to be bumped off anything. So I just want us to um, close with, um, from, from your perspective, how how should this fight go? How should this fight wrap up as we talk about ending the racist practices in education in Canada? And what is your word of encouragement for parents that are out there or young young people who may be watching this? Because we haven't even talked about it at the tertiary level. That's where I experienced racism in Canada the first time was entering York University, my first first um, class. No, second class, first year of university was where I experienced racism. So, you know, for those who will be watching this, what, what word of, um, you know, encouragement and word of charge that we have to the system? I, I just would like to say that um, for the parents and the students that uh, just know that your, your kids and yourselves, you're just as good as anyone else, you're just as smart. And, um, you know, we've been through the education system. Uh, there might be some subjects that you might not be good at if you, you continue with it, 
or if you get a, a tutor, someone who's in the school, um, who might be in two grades higher than you or a grade higher than you, or even your friend who might know how to do the work to assist you, um, that's something that, that could happen. And that's something where you could, you could actually learn and become, become better at, um, at, at that subject. And so just don't get, don't give up, you know, um, you're, you're not good in math in grade nine. That doesn't mean that by grade 10 that you're not going to uh, grasp the, the concepts. Keep, keep going at it. Um, a lot of the times, you know, when you're finished school, anyhow, you might not use a lot of what you've learned and um, you, you, you'll, you'll be happy with, with the, the rewards of you know going through school, finishing graduating. Because again, our graduation, um, our graduation uh, statistics are low. They don't have to be. They could be higher. And believe in yourself, and you will graduate. Mm -hmm. Lisa, um, I, I'm just um, concerned, like in terms of the rep, 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 like this repetition of the conversation every. 15, 20, 30 years. So my major concern is that we need to move beyond the token interventions, the band-aid situation, and we need to use, we make, we need to make better use of the resources that we have. And when I say that, I'm talking about like the teachers who are in the school board, um, who is seeing the streaming, uh, we need to hear their voices as well coming, um, just like the forum, because not everybody have the access, even what we're doing now, we're able to talk about it. Not everybody have the access to politicize um, the, the, the racism in the way we're doing. So people are who in the media. So we need to use those numbers. So that's what's happening. Um, even at the university level, these these numbers, these statistics that we're going to throw out here and there. But what are we going to be doing with those statistics? So we need to move beyond these token um, intervention. We also need to look at it from a, a holistic and by including the community as well. Um, parents, um, parents who might not have the access or comfortable. So we have to find ways in which we, we reach out to those parents because I'm also about intertwining um, the race with the class because there's also a major class issue here that we're not looking at. And I think that is where those quote unquote um, bad parents get pathologized who are not able to, they don't have the resources, they, they, they don't have the, the, the confidence and so forth. So those of us who do, I just think it's important. Like I feel like when I was doing the, um, very quickly, when I was doing the, um, the, the language assessment I spoke about, I felt like when I went into the job, I, I, I was sure they were gonna fire me um, because I was very adamant about um, students who they weren't gonna place in language development class. And I was very, I would advocate on behalf of the children. I even went as far as going and speaking to the parents because they would tell us, oh, just call the parents and find out this. It's like, I, can't, I couldn't do that. I couldn't be calling black parents and just telling them, oh, your child, will. I would call the parents and I would have discussion with the parents. So these are the ways in which we have to move away from the, that token solution using, you know, using the, all the resources that we have drawing upon the most knowledgeable. Um, and I'm not looking at the top 10 Del Du Bois either. I'm talking about people who have access, who have the capital to go out there to speak on behalf of, 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 of everyone or, or of, of the community. Yeah. And, um, you know, by way of wrapping up, I want to say that, I want to thank you, ladies, for the time, the time spent. We we kind of had a conversation with ourselves, but hopefully those who were um, watching um, got something from this um, experience. For me, what I want to get across was how I themed this whole <laughs> conversation is there is racism <laughs> in the system and it impacts education in a in a in a serious way and impacts our lives in a serious way that you know throughout the lived experiences we also learn some lessons we also um, learn how to better advocate even as having been victims of the system too right and we can also hold the system to account um, there are multiple studies that have been done and multiple recommendations that have been made let us all get aware of them so that we can help the advocates to advocate so that when we go to, to to parents teachers meetings across the gta or anywhere else in canada for that matter we can say oh by the way um i noticed that you guys are not upholding any of these recommendations you know what i mean so there are ways that we can all impact change um i do thank you for taking the time lisa all the way from jamaica <laughs> 
carrying all the way from um wherever <laughs> we're not telling people where you live um, <laughs> so we want to thank you ladies for the time and we want to thank those who participated those who listened in um and i hope the conversation continues um the aim of this series for me has been to interrogate racism in all its forms and the aim of this this, this, this series for me is at the very least to wake up some people and so if we are awake if we're truly awake we will seek change and we'll work towards change so i thank you again and have a good evening everyone thank you thank you Anthony. great series all right take good care night. Yeah. bye Good night.